chose to document dance line culture and style for the same reasons I suppose anyone chooses to document and research an art that they consider part of their cultural identity, celebration and preservation. The idea that representation is important is being proven again and again. It is so important to have black women at the helm of their stories, for their own voices to tell and define their own narratives. So, this is what HBCU Dance Line is. In the Southern United States, there are small teams of fierce and fearless black women that dance in their HBCU's marching bands. Some dance for the thrill. Some for scholarships. For popularity. For the sisterhood. But all dance for the passion. This particular dance culture is most prevalent in the South because the sites where this intangible cultural heritage is able to develop and grow are historically black colleges and universities. According to the U.S. Department of Education, HBCUs are colleges and universities in the United States that were accredited and established before 1964 and whose principal mission was the education of black Americans. During the time the HBCUs were founded, most tax-paying Black American citizens lived in the South and were legally barred from attending government and privately funded public institutions of higher learning until the Civil Rights Act of 1964 barred segregation in public places. Many Black people were still denied entry to most colleges and universities due to ingrained systemic racism. These safe spaces had to be created so that black citizens of America could participate in the American dream that education is meant to provide. Without looming threats of bigotry, judgment, forced assimilation, or harm to themselves or cultures. It is believed that Alcorn State University is the safe haven and fertile ground that nourished the first seeds of the HBCU dance line style and culture. Legend has it that the 1968 Golden Girls were the first team of majorettes to put their baton twirling to the side and just dance on the field with no props. Before them, most HBCU bands traditionally had teams of majorettes and male or female twirlers. That summer of 1968, the Alcorn State University football team was playing FAMU at the Orange Blossom Classic. It was pretty much the Super Bowl for HBCU football teams until its ending due to a decline in support of HBCU sports because the top black athletes were being recruited to the better funded athletic programs of predominantly white institutions that previously upheld segregation. At that time, the Alcorn State University band director, Samuel Griffin, needed something to show up the opposing band. Fam used the Marching 100. He decided that the Golden Girl Majorettes should ditch the traditional Majorette uniforms for gold sequined bodysuits and ditch twirling for youthful dances of the day. Just like today, it is said a hush came over the crowd as the eight young women marched down the sideline in their capes. The stadium exploded with applause as the capes were thrown off and the dancers showed what they could do. The idea immediately caught on throughout the late 60s and early 70s. Dance lines were formed at HBCU marching bands across the Gulf Coast to later become some of the most popular dance lines today. The tradition then swept the East Coast throughout the late 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. 
Dance lines are still being formed within HBCU band programs and in Black communities up to this day. These performance organizations have become sources for sorority-like bonds, as well as sources for social and economic empowerment for Black women and Black girls across America. In these spaces and with these movements, we are allowed to celebrate our beauty and our brains, our bodies and our Blackness, our intelligence and skills, unapologetically defining womanhood our own way, period. <laughs>